I discovered a statistic that forever changed my view of the world. The statistic basically stated that one day, oil would run out. It made me realize something. Everything we can touch can also one day run out. Scientifically speaking, there isn't an infinite supply of anything on our planet. And the things we love the most, the things we use the most, will be the first things to run out if we aren't careful. Oil will be one of the first things to go. About halfway through the 19th century, humans discovered a mysterious, thick, black substance deep inside the Earth. They named it crude oil. It was a type of fossil fuel, like coal or natural gas, that developed from the bones of creatures that lived millions of years before its gradual formation. The fact that these fuels take so long to form makes them non-renewable, meaning humans can't replace them like we can, say, grain. This also means that once we've used these fuels, they're gone, and we are using them. 75% of the U.S.'s crude oil consumption is due to gasoline. In the U.S., we consume roughly 20 million barrels of oil a day, 10 million more barrels a day than we produce. This shortage tends to make us reliant on foreign imports for a large percentage of the oil we consume. We Americans, who pride ourselves on being independent, self-sufficient, and pioneers of change, are actually heavily reliant on foreign nations to give us what we crave most, oil. Oil was and is the Achilles heel of modern society. And before we let it bring us to our knees, we must rid ourselves of our dependence on it. The first thing we must consider is the environment. Given it is talked and debated about so frequently, however, I will keep it simple. What is oil consumption actually doing to our environment? When you're driving your car, you aren't just using up gas. What's actually occurring are tiny little explosions in your engine, releasing carbon dioxide. This carbon is released from your car and becomes carbon emission. When you're sitting idle in the carpool line or speeding down the highway, it floats upwards into the sky. There, it clusters, forming a gaseous wall. This dense gas wall, made up in part by the carbon emitted by your car, is kind of like a prison guard. And the inmate is heat from the sun. The carbon lets in heat, but as soon as heat previously allowed in, or heat created on Earth tries to get out, it is trapped. This heat builds up, but never diminishes in any significant way, making the Earth hotter and hotter each year. This is why carbon dioxide, the gas formed from all of this carbon waste, is considered a greenhouse gas. It lets in heat, but doesn't let it back out, the function a greenhouse serves. Climate change aside, pollution is also a major issue presented with exuberant oil consumption rates. The skies in Chinese cities are often brown because of their overusage of oil and coal. And the air is hot and often unsafe in American cities, where cars bustle this way and that, all the while emitting deadly gases into the sky. Yet even these ominous brown skies aren't enough to make us change our ways. At one point, we looked to the skies for answers and for guidance. Now, the skies are neglected, despite all they can tell us about what the future holds if we continue in our excessive ways. The next thing we must consider is war. A world war, or a war on any large scale, is something many believe is not possible in this day and age. But human conflict is a part of human nature. War will always find its way back to humanity. Today, wars are fought more by man-powered machines than soldiers fighting on the ground. Here's the dilemma, however. Most of these machines are powered by the same thing our cars are powered by. Oil. The U.S. is the biggest superpower in the world, with the largest military in the world. And yet, compared to almost every other country, we are disadvantaged by our extreme oil consumption. This means, in essence, that our safety depends on oil. We need to save oil so that we have enough of it to keep international conflict off of American soil. But perhaps the best reason we shouldn't be dependent on oil is that we simply don't have to be. We have the technology today to completely change our ways, to rid ourselves of our dependency. We have electric cars that continue to grow stronger and have longer ranges. And we have electric power stations popping up all over the United States. It is simply the change that acts as a barrier between us and achieving independence from oil. The unknown is scary. And for many, driving an electric car, for example, is part of the unknown, unfamiliar, something many would not even consider doing but all great change has been thwarted by our natural cowardice towards it. Today, 
I ask you to gather up your courage. And when you go to buy your next car, if you even consider buying electric, a change will have been made. But this isn't really about saving oil for better things or buying an electric car. This is about changing. Changing the way we're going to leave the earth looking like when we're through with it. Keeping the earth bountiful for our children and theirs. I'm a teenager and hopefully have lots of time left on this earth. But how we're using its resources, or rather, how we're abusing its resources, makes me worry about my future. This needs to be a priority. No petty argument will get us nowhere. It is time for us, conservatives, liberals, libertarians, authoritarians alike, to bury the hatchet. Something needs to happen, and oil is where we need to start. We need to change before changing won't be enough. And now, as we wander into the frontier that is the future, it seems as though we won't have the luxury of change for much longer. So do something about it. Not for yourself, but for the future population of the world, yours and my children and eventually theirs, the ones who will be stuck desperately trying to repair what we have broken, renew what we have lost. Please, before it's too late, carpool, buy an electric car, buy a more gas-efficient car, or God forbid, a Prius. Do something. Thank you.